Chapter 17 of Bob's A Girl Detective This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Bob's A Girl Detective by Grace May North Chapter 17 Bob's Tries Acting When they were behind the scenes, a short, flashily attired man advanced to meet Roberta, and the usher departed. For one panicky moment, Bobs wondered whether she should tell that she was a detective. Would the director wish her to interfere with his plans, as she undoubtedly would be doing, were she to take from him one of his chorus girls? The alert little man, however, did not need to be told, for he had caught a glimpse of Roberta's badge when a projecting bit of scenery had for a moment pulled at her coat. Rubbing his hands and smiling ingratiatingly, he said in a voice of oily smoothness, Is it one of our girls, ma'am, that you're wishing to see? Bob realized that he had guessed her mission, and so she thought best to be perfectly frank with him and tell the whole story. The little man seemed greatly relieved, and shook his head many times as he talked. No such girl here, he assured her, I'd turn her over to her ma if there was. Come and see. The small man spun around with the suddenness of a top, and Bob's could not help thinking that his build suggested the shape of that toy. Then he darted away, dodging the painted trees with great dexterity, leading the way down dark aisles among the scenes that were not to be used that day. At last they reached the dressing rooms. Look in all of them, he said. Don't knock, just walk in. Then, with a flourish of his plump, diamond-bedecked hands, which seemed to bestow upon her the freedom of the place, the small man gave another of his top-like spins and disappeared among the scenery. Roberta found herself standing near a door on which was a large gilt star. No need to go in there, she decided, for, of course, the girl whom she sought would not be the company's star. But since she had open sesame of all the rooms, why not enter? She had always been wild to go behind the scenes when she and her sisters had been seated in a box in this very theater. Little had she dreamed in those days, that now seemed so far in the past, that day would come when she would be behind the scenes in the role of an amateur detective. As Roberta stood gazing at the closed door, she saw it open, and a maid, dressed trimly in black and white, hurried out, leaving the door ajar. Glancing in, Bob saw a truly beautiful young woman lounging in a comfortable chair in front of a long mirror. The maid had evidently been arranging her hair. Several elaborate gowns were hanging about the room. Suddenly Roberta flushed, for she realized that a pair of darkly lashed eyes were observing her in the mirror. Then the beautiful face smiled, and a slim, white hand beckoned. Entering the small dressing room, Roberta also smiled into the mirror. Forgive me for gazing so rudely, she apologized, but all my life I have wished that I might meet a real star. The young woman turned, and with a graceful yet indolent gesture, bade Roberta to be seated on a low chair that was facing her. Don't, was all that she said, and the visitor thought that even that harsh word was like music, so deep and rich was the voice that uttered it. Bob's was puzzled. She looked up inquiringly. Don't what? she asked. The white hand rested on Roberta's knee, as the voice continued kindly. If you were my sister, I would say don't. Don't take up the stage as a profession. It's such a weary, thankless life. Only a few of us reach the top, little girl, and it's such a hard grind. Too, if you want to live right, theatrical folk think you are queer, and you don't win their friendship. They say you're not their kind. But you, Roberta breathed, with very evident admiration. You are a star. You do not need their friendship. She was thinking of the small, florid man who had suggested a top. The actress smiled, and then hurriedly added in a low voice, 
for the maid was returning. I haven't time to talk more now, but, dear girl, even as a star, I say, don't. Bob's impulsively caught the frail hand and held it in a close clasp. She wondered why there were tears in the dark-lashed eyes. As she was closing the door after her, she heard the maid address the star as Miss Mary Hart. Another fictitious name that doesn't fit, Bob's thought. How she longed to go back to the little dressing room and ask Miss Mary Hart if there was something, anything, she could do for her. But instead, with half a sigh, she turned toward an open door beyond, which she could hear laughter and joking. Bob's wondered if among those chorus girls she would find the one she sought. The door to the larger room was ajar, and Roberta entered. As she had guessed, there was a bevy of girls in the room. A dozen mirrors lined the walls, and before each of them stood a young girl applying paint or powder to her face, or adjusting a wig with long golden curls. Some of them were dressed in spangly tights, and others in very short skirts that stood out stiffly. This was unmistakably the chorus. Hello, sweetie, a buxom maiden near the door sang out when she observed the newcomer. What line of talk are you going to give us? The last guy, as was here, asked us if our souls was saved. Is that the dope you've got up your sleeve? Roberta smiled so frankly that she seemed to disarm their fears that they were to be preached to. I say, she began, as she sat on a trunk near the door, do you all like this life? Another girl whirled about, and pausing in the process of applying a lipstick, she winked wisely at the one who had first spoken. Say, Pink, she called, I got her spotted. She's an ink slinger for some daily. Wrong you are, Bobs replied merrily. Then she turned to a slender girl who was standing at the mirror next to her, who had appeared quite indifferent to the newcomer's presence. How is it with you? Roberta asked her directly. Do you like this life? But it was one of the bolder girls who replied, Sure thing. We all like the life. It's great. Going to join the high kicks? The question was asked by still another girl, who, having completed her toilet, now sauntered up and stood directly in front of Bob's. For one moment, the young detective's heart beat rapidly, for the newcomer's resemblance to the picture was striking. But another girl was saying, B. there's been with his here show for two years, and she likes the life, don't you, B? So after all, this wasn't the one whom she sought. Bob's decided to take them into her confidence. Smiling around in the winning way that she had, she began, Girls, you've had three guesses and missed, so now I'll put you wise. I'm looking for a Winifred Waring Winston, whose mama, dear, wishes to see her at once, if not sooner. Can you tell me at which theater I can find her? The others grouped about Roberta, but all shook their heads. Don't know, as I'd squeal on her if I did know, said the one called Pink, but as it happens, I don't. Nor did the others, it would seem, and when Roberta was convinced that Winnie was not to be found there, she left. But as the curtain had raised on the first scene, she paused near the front door to hear Miss Mary Hart sing. Truly, she was an actress, Bob's thought, for no one in that vast audience who saw the star could have guessed that only a brief time before there had been tears in those dark-lashed eyes that now seemed to be brimming with mirth. At the next theater she entered, Bob's had an unexpected and rather startling experience. Just as she appeared in the dimly lighted space back of the scenes, she was pounced upon by a man who was undoubtedly the stage manager. Miss Finefeather, he said in a hoarse whisper, what, you late again? Two minutes only to get into your riggin. Then, giving Bob's a shove toward an open door, he called hoarsely, here's that laggard, Stella. Help her and be quick. We don't want any hitches in this scene. No time for explaining. That and settling accounts will come later, he added, when Bob's tried to turn back to explain that she was not Miss Finefeather. 
The man was gone, and the leading chorus girl pounced upon her, and, with the aid of two others, she was being disrobed. To her amusement, as well as amazement, she soon found herself arrayed in tights with a short spangled overskirt. Resignedly, she decided to see it through. Just at that moment a buzzer sounded, which seemed to be a signal for the entrance of the chorus. "'Here are you, Miss Finefeather,' someone was saying. "'Can't you remember overnight where your place is? Just back of me, and do everything I do, and you'll get through all right.' The voice was evidently intended to be kind. Bobs followed the one ahead, trying to suppress an almost uncontrollable desire to laugh. Who in the world did they suppose her to be? She wondered. The girls had divided into two long lines as they entered the stage from opposite sides. Bobs was thinking, I've heard folks say it's hard to get on the stage. Strikes me it's just the other way. I jolly wish, though, I had some idea what I'm supposed to do. Roberta's reverie was interrupted by her kindly neighbor, who whispered, Give me your paw. Here's where we swing, and don't forget to keep your feet going all the time. There's no standing still in this act. Being in it, Bob's decided to try to do her best, and having been a champion in school athletics, she was limber and mentally alert and went through the skipping and whirling and various gyrations almost as well as though she had been trained. However, when the act was finished and the chorus girls, with a burst of singing laughter, had run from the stage, the man whom she had first seen came up to her, profuse with apologies. He had just received a message telling him that Miss Finefeather was very ill and wouldn't be able to keep on with the work. You're a wonder, he exclaimed, with very sincere admiration. How you went through that act and never missed, so one could notice it, proves you're the right girl for the place. Say you like it, and the position is yours. Bob's paused, but in that moment she seemed to hear Miss Mary Hart's one word, don't. Roberta thanked the man, but said that her business engagements for that afternoon were so urgent that she could not even remain for another act. Having learned that Miss Finefeather had been with them but a few days, Bobs, believing that she might be the girl whom she sought, asked for her address and departed. Her heart was filled with hope. I believe I've hit the right trail, she thought, as she hurried out of the theater. End of Chapter 17 Recording by Richard Kilmer, Real Medina, Texas.